I on now? All right. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Well, appreciate you all coming out tonight. And um, when Nick asked me to do this, I'm like looking out at all these years of uh, mature Christian living, and I'm thinking, why in the world would you ask me to teach these people? anything, but I'm going to do my best, and um, what I'm going to do tonight is, uh, you know, Nick's kind of like the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I'm kind of like the Cliff Notes guy with uh, Philippians, so this may go a little faster than him, so I'm just going to do the, the next two sessions that we had um, in our book, beginning on page 30, and if we get through those faster than our hour, you know, we'll just go ahead and break and go from there. All right. So, okay, again, we're going to start on page 30 with uh, chapter 3, session 2. And uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to focus on three basic things. You know, first, we're going to talk about the value of salvation. Secondly, we're going to talk about what it takes to become a Christian, kind of like what Craig was talking about this morning. And then um, we're going to end with some uh, information on living the Christian life. So, value of salvation, becoming a Christian, and living the Christian life. Now, let, let's take a look at the scripture, uh, the first scripture on that page is uh, Philippians 3, and these are verses 7 through 10. It says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. But that which is uh, through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, it is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So in, in the first verses we're looking at today, Paul's basically saying that, you know, everything that was once near and dear to his heart, it doesn't really mean anything to him anymore. It's not important to him anymore. <coughs> Essentially calls it rubbish, and this is kind of, um, I teach a young adult Sunday school class, this is kind of related to something we were talking about today. We've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount for a couple months now, and um, we've gotten to the part where uh, Jesus is talking about how you cannot serve two masters. And when we started talking about this, we got on the topic of dreams you had as a little kid. Can anybody here remember, like, was there something you dreamed of being when you were a little kid? Too far back. <laughs> <laughs> so. In the reverse, there were many things I dreamed would never happen. Yep. It did yep. happen. I think that was just in reverse of things that you, you dreamed would happen, but I never dreamed. Yeah, I, I had this... Uh, this dream in my life, and I, nobody in my class could remember this guy because they're younger than me, but how many people remember Larry Zonka? Anybody remember that name? Yeah. So, you know, when I was about my daughter's age, the Miami Dolphins had just won the Super Bowl, and I thought, you know, I want to be Larry Zonka. You know, I want to be a professional football player, be a running back, and, you know, play on Sundays. I mean, that, that was just, you know, I had that in my head, and Mom and Dad, that Christmas before, had bought me a Miami Dolphins helmet, gotten me a Larry Zonka jersey, and so I'd be out there. You know, we lived out on a farm. I'd be out there running around, you know, pretending I was running over people and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I just thought, basically, that if I could be like Larry Zonka, that everything in my life would be perfect. But, you know, when, when we get older, when we become adults, you know, our dreams don't really go away, do they? You know, I mean... They just change into other things, and you know, I mean, some of us, you know, think, you know, everything would be great if I just had a big savings account, or, you know, if I had that nice house instead of the one I'm living in now, or, you know, if, you know, if I had an office in the church where people really respected me, or, you know, it could, it could be anything, you know, uh, if that lady would just go out with me and, you know, agree to date me, you know, so, you know, we, we set our sights on different things, but we're still setting our sights on things, and uh, there's a a pastor named Tim Keller, and he, he wrote this book called Counterfeit Gods. And what he um, said in Counterfeit Gods is that he gave a fill in the blank. He said, anytime you have something where you say, my life would be complete if I had blank. Or, you know, conversely, if you had something where you said, um, you know, my life just wouldn't be worth living if I didn't have this. He said, what you're doing is actually 
idolatry. You know, um, you know, when you think of idols, a lot of people just think back to the golden calf or something like that. But, you know, uh, Keller says that anything can be an idol. Anything that you place before God can be an idol in your life. And I think what Jesus was getting at, uh, you know, when he was talking about, um, you know, you can't serve two masters, is that, you know, you can't have any idols before God. You know, anything that steps between you and your relationship with God is um, not a good thing. And what I think Paul is just kind of circling back around to what Paul was saying in the beginning of this, when he says that all the things that you know, he once held as important were worthless to him, I think what he's saying is, you know, he had gotten rid of those idols that he had in his life. You know, he um, was a pretty important man at his time. You know, Brother Nick has talked about that. You know, he had the best education. You know, he was... Uh, a very important person in the uh, Jewish, I guess you wouldn't call it church, but in Jewish society. And, um, you know, after he found Christ, you know, none of that really meant anything to him. So, so that, that's kind of like the, the value. Like he gives us that perspective on the value of salvation. You know, nothing else is important. And um, so as we go deeper into this passage, you know, we uh, get to the main topics of uh, knowing and growing. And that is, you know, what it takes to become a Christian, and also what it means to live a life that's devoted to Christ and to become more like him. You know, we can see in verse 9 um, what it means to know Christ when Paul says, uh, and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. You know, and we all like to think we do our fair share of the work, don't we? You know, everybody wants to think they're doing their fair share, you know, even if they may not be doing it. And, um, you know, even in terms of, you know, our relationship with God, a lot of times people want to think that they're somehow justifying themselves. And, um, you know, they're, uh, they're doing their part of the bargain, so God just needs to hold up his end. And, and unfortunately, um, my father-in-law is kind of an example of this. You know, he's... Uh, He's not saved, and he's not really receptive to salvation. You know, Jen and I have tried talking to him about it. You know, he grew up in the Catholic Church and was an altar boy. And you know, when we broached the subject with him, you know, his kind of standard is, uh, you know, I, I did my time when I was a little boy, and you know, I'm good. You know, and, and you know, he basically is saying, you know, I did some stuff about 60 years ago for a few Sundays, and uh, you know. That's all I need to do, and God owes me now. And uh, it's just been hard to break through to him. You know, he thinks that, you know, that's, that's the way to do. But, you know, that's, that's workspace salvation, isn't it? You know, he's thinking that he did something, and um, God owes him salvation in return. But what Paul is saying here is that righteousness comes from God through faith. So we don't bring anything to the table. And um, if you look at Romans uh, chapter 4... This is verses 1 through 8. He actually goes into a deeper explanation of this. He's uh, talking about Abraham here. But he says, uh, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited to them as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. So... You know, we receive our not guilty verdict, not because of something we did, but because of something God did for us. So, you know, we've got nothing to brag about and everything to be thankful for. So now let, let's kind of move from, uh, you know, how to know Christ to uh, growing in Christ. And we're, we're going to pick up in verse 10. And verse 10 actually says some pretty astonishing things, I think, you know. Paul starts out with, you know, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, which you know, sounds pretty good. But then he goes on to say, 
and the fellowship of sharing his sufferings, becoming like him in death. And yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I became a Christian, that wasn't really something I thought about, you know? Did any of you think about sharing in Christ's suffering when you became a Christian? Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, yeah, I was very thankful for what I've received, but I hadn't really thought the whole thing through. You know, I was, uh, you know, was happy for uh, my conversion, but, you know, it wasn't until years later when I f figured out that, you know, suffering filled into the, you know, fitted into the equation. I remember um, when I was in graduate school and, um, you know, sitting around with a bunch of people, and I, it was just amazing to me, like, how many non-Christians there are, you know, when I was in college. And it was uh, not just non-Christians, but it was uh, quite a few people who were, you know, pretty openly hostile to Christian, you know, Christianity. And, you know, that, that was kind of when I started figuring out what Jesus meant when he was saying that. Um, and that's, you know, of course, just a mild taste of what people in other countries like the Sudan have to deal with, you know, to live for Christ. And, um, you know, Paul uh, talks more about this in Romans 12, 1, where um, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. So, you know, Paul is saying we have to be willing to suffer. You know, offer yourselves as sacrifices. And, um, you know, so we have to be willing, but, you know, why would Paul want to share in Christ's suffering, do you think? To honor and glorify his name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I think Paul was, you know, truly, he truly realized the value of his gift. I mean, he was, you know... If Christ suffered, you know, I want to, you know, I'll, I'll do the same for him. And, and, you know, if you go back to Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, Jesus spelled it out for us. You know, he didn't try to trick us. He said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. So, you know, Jesus did say, I mean, we're, we're going to have a tough time of it sometimes here on earth because of his name. But... If you keep the goal in mind and keep what's coming, you know, when you get to heaven, it's, it's a little bit easier to have that, to have a good attitude about that. And uh, now I'm, I'm going to move on over. Let's see. Oh, we're doing real good on time. <laughs> I'm going to start with the second um, uh, section that's on page 32. So we're going to and continue talking about growth in Christ and moving toward the prize. Um, this is verses 11. Skip. Uh, ours is not the same as what you just got. You got a different number. Uh, 34. 34. Yeah. So it, it's um, the, the one where it starts at uh, verse 11. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Nick gave me a, a book that had his, some of his notes in there, and I guess the page number was a little bit different. So, so anyway, yeah, we're going to look at verses 11 through 16, and we're going to continue talking about growth in Christ, and we're also going to be talking about moving toward that prize that we just mentioned. And uh, when I read this, I'm going to include that last phrase from verse 10 here because it kind of figures into what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to start with the last of verse 10. and It goes like this. Uh, Becoming like him in death and so somehow to attain a resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I did not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Attained. So... So in verses 10 and 11, we're starting to learn how to be more like Christ. So, you know, how, how do we um, become more like Christ? Yeah, yeah. And Paul is saying here, you know, we, we basically live a resurrected life, you know. And if you think about the example of Christ, you know, he died and rose from the dead so we could have life. And... Think about us as Christians. You know, Paul is saying we're supposed to die to self here, right? So we die to self so we can live for Christ. And if you do that, then similar to Christ, our resurrected lives can help bring others to salvation 
the same way he's bringing us to salvation. So it, it's kind of a, a circle. And we're obviously less than Christ, but we're following his example and, and doing uh, what he did. So, you know, and dying to self isn't easy, obviously. You know, you got to put aside all those little things that you thought you just had to have and uh, focus on what he wants you to do. So in verse 12, we see that, the um, you know, we can see the prize, but we aren't there yet. You know, it says, not that I have already obtained this or have been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. All right. Think about birthdays. You know, um, when you were a kid, you loved them, didn't you? Yeah. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, now that we get a little older, and I'm, I'm including myself in that, that group too, you know, you kind of love them, but you, you also kind of don't like them so much anymore, right? You know, because, uh, I mean, on the plus side, you know, having another birthday means you're still alive and kicking, you know, so, which is a good thing, but... You know, it also means you're another year older, which is, you know, maybe not so good. You know, your joints don't work the way they used to, or, you know, all these other little problems are coming up. So, but one thing about being another year older, though, is that, you know, presumably, hopefully, you're another year wiser, right? You know, that, that's one thing that, you know, your, your uh, physical body may be slowing down, but you, hopefully your wisdom is perking up a little bit. And... <laughs> That's right. So yeah, there there are good things about it, right? So, <laughs> but but yeah, with God, you know, His plan for us, you know, as we grow older as Christians, is uh, you know, He wants us to continue growing spiritually through our Christian lives, right? You know, we're not supposed to be standing still; we're supposed to be progressing. And, you know, we, we talked about sanctification in Sunday school, you know, that process. And we said, you know, if you take like an EKG, you know, looks like this. If you kind of tilt it upward, that's what sanctification looks like. You know, you, you got your ups and downs, but the trend is going upward. And that's what God wants us to do. You know, he wants us to continue to grow closer to him, continue to look for him in everything in our lives and uh, continue to become more Christ-like. So, you know. And Paul's saying, you know, at least, you know, as we're here on earth, you know, we never really arrive, so to speak, but we're just continuing to become more and more like Christ until after we leave this earth and uh, become sanctified and glorified. Next, Paul, in verse 13, talks about do one thing. He says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. So Paul is talking about getting to the prize here, and he gives two pieces of instruction to these folks. He says, number one, forget the past, and number two, strain toward what's ahead. Now, um, Nick actually put this question in his notes, and I thought it was a really good one. He said, you know, why do we need to forget the past? Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. You know, it's uh, there's a, there's actually you know, you know, one way of uh, you know forgetting the past. I think there's two things here. I'm getting a little uh, ahead of myself, but one is you know, in your past, people have done things to you that have caused hurt in your life. Well, that's that's true for almost everybody. Now, you know, once you become a Christian. You know, if you're still holding on to these grudges from your past, I mean, isn't that going to hurt your witness? Isn't that going to keep you from being everything God wants you to be? So, so that's, that's one thing. And then another thing, and, and this was something that, that actually happened to me. You know, it's uh, forgiving yourself of things that you've done in the past. You know, we've all done stupid stuff that we regret, you know, and, uh, you know, some of us worse things than others, but... Um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to bet that everybody, you know, has something that they regret, you know, during the time before they became a Christian. And, and probably stuff that you regret after you become a Christian, too. Isn't that what Jesus was talking about when he said, blessed are those who mourn? And that's when you talk yeah, about your Yeah, I past. think so. You know, I think so. If you regret it, you kind of mourn over it, but yeah, he's forgiven you of it. Yeah. But the devil will dredge it up on you when he was riding you. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. I mean, I... Um, you know, if you let these things that you've done in the past come back to haunt you, 
You know, I, I've heard people say, and I've actually had this thought myself, you know, why would somebody want to listen to me, you know, after all the stuff I did? I mean, has anybody else had that experience? You know, I mean, it's... Um, don't you think that's why most people don't witness more often? Do I think that's why? I, I do. I do. And, and you know what's ironic to me is that, um, I'm not going to tell you who this was, but um, a member of this church talked to me last week, and he told me about his past and what he had done and how he had changed. And that's one of the most powerful things I think you, you have is, that, you know, like, you know, I did all this and look what Jesus did for me and look how he's changed me. But, you know, so many of us, I think, are, are kind of, you look back and, and you just think that, uh, you know, somehow you're not completely forgiven. But, you know, if God's forgiven us, who are we to keep holding on to that stuff? Well, Paul wrote this. Look at, look at what Paul was before Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. I mean, yeah. he was persecuted, put him in jail, beat him, put him in yeah. Christian. Of all yeah. people, yeah. God wrote much of you. <laughs> he's the best yeah. example yeah. of what you're talking about. Yeah, that's yeah, that's hard to keep in mind sometimes, but that's you know that's important. Gary, what about the, the analogy that you gave a while ago about your father-in-law? Mm -hmm. he, he'll have to forget what's behind him in order to move on. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, he is a uh, forgive this friend, but he's a stubborn old man, you know. And we, uh, <laughs> we have tried with him, and uh, he just uh, yeah, we hope we'll break through one day. But he, you know, he's one of those folks that you know. He'll tell you everything, but he doesn't like for you to tell him anything. And, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, I, I think that's kind of where he's stumbling. And that has to be done through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, so anyway, um, let's see, where was I here? So, you know, like I say, God's forgiven us. Forgive yourself and move on. That'll help you be a better servant to Christ. And this, the verse, so you know, doesn't just tell us you know, to forget the past, but it also tells us to strain toward what's ahead. And you know, we've gone through a tough few years in this country. And I know some of you in this room have gone through some, you know, tough situations recently. I think about the boyettes, you know, with Danny and all his health struggles. You know, I mean, that's everybody has tough times that they have in their lives. You know, Mr. Edwards just had a, you know. A, health scare here a couple months back. And, um, but I think what Paul is trying to get us to do here is, you know, don't get so much bogged down in the challenges that you're facing today. You gotta, gotta kind of look out on the horizon and see that glorification that you're gonna receive in the future. And that, that gives you that perspective today to you know, get through the tough times, you know? I mean, even Jesus said, every day has enough troubles of its own, you know? You know, so. <laughs> you know, as Christians, you know, we, we know we're going to have struggles like everybody else, but we just know we have a Savior that's going to see us through eternity. Well, I think that Paul's, you know, Paul's only one, I think, well, yeah. a couple went into heaven and seeing all mm -hmm. these marvelous and wonderful things. Mm -hmm. Paul was a, the most serious person I ever met, you know, as far as his writing and everything. And, you know, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. So, I mean, Paul was a very extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, definitely was that. I mean, you know, God took a, you know, a man with extraordinary intelligence and talent, and you know, he turned it to his purposes, and look what we got. You know. So, uh, you know, and um, you know, we're just saying, you know, press on toward the goal that God has called you to in verse 14, and, and, and think about what those things are, you know. We're going to have resurrection bodies that don't have any creaks in them, you know, don't have any... Uh, Things that are too sore or, you know, don't work anymore. And, um, yeah, we're going to see loved ones again. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see my grandparents. Yeah. The, the two words that he uses there, straining and press, would indicate that, that it's not going to be easy. That's right. That's exactly right. Paul had to strain to press on, and, and when he has to press to go forward, it's not going to be walking hard. No, it sure isn't. That's exactly right. So, so, and uh, finally, um, what Paul is saying here is, is that we need to seek godly understanding. Th these are verses uh, 15 and 16. He said, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. 
And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So how can we be mature in Christ? Well, first, we have to know all we can about him. You know, um, too many people, the only time they ever crack open a Bible is when they sit in church on a Sunday or, you know, go to a Bible study on Wednesday. And you're not going to get the full benefit of God's word if that's all you're doing. And, you know, you have to spend time in prayer. This is another weak spot of mine. I'm, I'm not as good a prayer as I should be. But spending time in prayer and, you know, fellowship with Christ. You know, and, uh, you know, are you sharing the gospel as Jesus directed? I'm, I'm checking off a bunch of things on here where I could certainly improve. You know, I look at, like, Bob and Jerry and how much they go out and go around and talk to people. And that gives me something to shoot for. And, um... You know, you also, you know, want to let other people see Jesus in your life, you know. You ever heard that question, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you, you know. Um, people need to see that in you. You know, sometimes, you know, I think we have the tendency as Christians to let people see the Pharisee in us instead of seeing the Christ in us. And that, that repels people. But, you know, if you think of the example of Jesus' life, you know. Who were the people that flocked to him? You know, it was the people that were kind of, you consider, you know, the, the dregs and losers of society, you know, the, the people who, uh, you know, the tax collectors who nobody wanted to talk to, or, you know, you know the poor people, you know, I mean, all these people were attracted to him, so obviously he was doing something different. Sometimes you have to agree to disagree. That's right. And, and let the little things that get in the way, uh, don't let them keep you from your focus. Because that's one of the devil's greatest strategies, is to divert you from what you know is the right way to go and, uh, and cause you to, to struggle and fall. And, and yet, if you don't let that bother you that much, and you pray for yourself and you pray for the fellow that you're disagreeing with and you go on and work together on those things that you can. That's that's the thing I think we have to look at in our lives. Yep, that's, that's something we have to remind ourselves over and over again too, you know. Jim has told us in Sunday school many times about plowing down the field and you come upon a big rock and you can't go over it or under it, so you just plow around it and keep going. <laughs> Sometimes it's a lot easier to go around than try to fix the <laughs> so, um, But anyway, let's, let's see what else I had there. I just had a couple, couple other things. Uh, the last thing Paul tells us is to live up to what we have already attained. So, you know, and again, you know, he, was, he was kind of settling a little uh, disagreement here, but he's just reminded them, you know, Christ has given us a wonderful gift, hasn't he? I mean, there's no two ways about that. And, if our goal is to become more Christ-like, you know, we've got to set some of these things aside, you know. You've got to ask yourself, is what I'm doing here today 
moving me closer to that goal, or is it backing me farther away from it? And, uh, and Paul's telling me, you know, remember what you got here. You don't want to you know, mess up your witness. You don't want to mess up your church. You don't want to mess up your fellowship. Yeah, do what's right and make peace. 